Oh, Canada. Have any of you been watching the news lately and thought to yourself, what the hell is going on? You can't change the channel without hearing about more job losses, swine flu, the recession, war in Afghanistan, and another election already? What could all of this mean? Well, let's start off with money. Where does it even come from? Where do I think it comes from? Like it's made? Um, I don't know, the government? Money comes from uh, paper. I believe it comes from trees. <laughs> in, the, in the long run, I think it comes from trees. No, I believe money. I actually, I'm not 100% sure. Well, I, I'm not certain. That's a trick question. Why? Well, it's a, that's a, it's actually an interesting question. The first of all, money is uh, prior to money. It's going to sound like a long answer, but I'm, I'm not quite sure I know the nature of your question. But let me see how I can handle it. Prior, thank you. Prior to um, prior to money, essentially trade. Um, it's actually simple. Over ninety-five percent of our money is created by private banks. <laughs> That means there's less than 5% of government created money. Let's look at the differences between creating the money ourselves and borrowing it from private banks. Creating the money ourselves pretty much just costs the labor to print it and the hard work to back it up. While borrowing money from private banks can cost up to 10 times or more than the principal before it's paid. Don't believe me? I think that the problem isn't necessarily, in my opinion, um, that we uh, that we issued that debt um, through uh, through a competitive bond process. Um, the issue is that the, uh, the the level of spending that we engaged in uh, was not appropriate, uh, and we got into a situation where we we spent too much. This is Canada's federal debt. From 1867 to 1992, we owed 423 billion dollars. However, 91 percent of this debt is the result of interest on interest. And only 8% of the money was actually used on real things, like goods and services. But now we have to pay back over 10 times what we needed, simply because we borrowed from private banks instead of ourselves. So where do these private banks get their billions of dollars from that they lend out? Nowhere! They just write down a number on a piece of paper and lend it out as if it was money to families trying to put a roof over their heads, students trying to get an education, or governments looking to improve the country. Banks then get paid multiple times back with your hard work. Every time they issue a loan, they are creating brand new money. It never existed before you walked into the bank. So pretty much like you say, I go into a bank, they buy, they, I, I say, you know, well, can I have like uh, $10,000 to pay for my college? I yeah, say, sure, you here, go. let me just go run this off the machine and then you can pay us back with your hard-earned money. Right. That's exactly it. That, that's pretty crazy. They just get you to believe that they're lending you what's inside their vaults. But it couldn't be further from the truth. For instance, banks. Yeah. Your banks have the amount of money that they have in reserve. The answer is no. There's about $50 billion of real cash in Canada. All the private banks combined only have $4 billion in their vaults, or what they call reserves. And yet they've lent out $1.5 trillion, which they then charge interest on. I think that the, the amount of money that's held in reserve um, in Canada, um, you're right, is pretty low. Um, one of the reasons it's so low is because our, our banking system is as stable as it is. Um, okay. So what would happen if we simply wanted our money back? We would have a credit crisis in the end, and the system would, would uh, not be sustainable. So we'd have to reorganize and restructure, which is what happened actually in the Depression. 
Um, I don't see that happening again. Yeah. <laughs> but theoretically, that's what would happen. <clears throat> oh, yeah, that sounds like a stable system. So isn't it a little bit fraudulent, though, if I were to walk into a bank and they give me a receipt that's I can redeem at any time, but it's only noticed that it, it, it would be called fraud if everyone came to the bank and requested their money. Oh, I'm going to answer your question, but then I want to go back to mine. Okay, because Because okay. it really is. This is the huge change okay. of the last five years. It's not fraudulent. It's not fraudulent. Um, because everybody understands it, but it is not. Not no one really understands. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, those who those who th those who know about it, it knew about it, so it was not fraudulent. I I I, I talked to the like teachers and, and, and MPs even MPPs, and they, they had no idea that uh, that there was only four billion dollars in the vaults, but over a trillion dollars is lent out. No, no, let me go back. Well, the fact that they didn't know it. They should have. I mean, but no, but but really, no one does. With that quick, with I, should should that be involved a little bit more before we start using money? That we should be told where it is, where it comes from. Well, no. Okay, so it's one thing to lend out money you just don't have, but how can you charge interest on nothing, and not just any kind of interest? Compound interest. Here's a fun way to explain the difference between regular interest and compounded interest. Imagine lending someone one dollar at the time Christ was born. At let's say six percent interest. Ready? Go! To every Jesus Christ is right! This is especially scary when you consider that all credit cards, loans, and mortgages are all to be paid back with compounded interest. By the way, if you translate the word mortgage to its original language French, it literally means death pledge because people will often work their whole lives to pay off their home by the time the banks have made all their money. Interestingly enough, the French Canadians use a different word for mortgage called hypothèque. Probably because no one in their right mind would sign up for something called a death pledge. Could you imagine? So coming back to our analogy on compounded interest, you can probably see why Jesus threw the bankers out of the temple in the New Testament. And look what ended up happening to him. It's interesting how the operation of banks in Canada are all textbook examples of fraud, counterfeit, and theft. There was no fraud. People should have known. And, but there really is a problem. And that is that the people who knew didn't stop it. Now, if I did what these private banks do on a daily basis, I would end up here. Here. Or maybe here. So how come the banks can break the law, but no one else can? Well, it's technically not breaking the law when our elected officials create bogus legislation like what's contained in the Bank Act. It says that banks can lend out as much money as they want without having to have a single dollar. In 1991, there was legislation passed in the Bank Act that stated that reserve requirements for banks is completely nil. They don't need to have a dollar in their vaults to actually issue out money. Hmm. Yeah, we, that, I, I don't know if I could agree with you on that. Well, maybe you'll agree with the office of Jim Flaherty when they say, 
there is no statutory reserve for banks in Canada. And not that they don't have no reserves, because they do, but according to the bank... Can I just take this, sir? Yeah. yeah. John Gray? Yeah, go ahead. I had read that somewhere in the Bank Act of Canada that it was allowed that somewhere between 1990 and 1991 that reserve requirements for banks would be phased out in the next few months. I tightened them up. So, so they, they have returned to. I tightened them up. They were, they were, they were, they were eased up. Uh, conservatives eased them up in '90 or '91. Yeah. And I tightened them up in '95. So, what, what did you make them? What, what is the you what, said what between they, what they are now, what they are now? It's roughly roughly seven to one. Roughly seven to one. But I want to go back to the main question. Maybe he means he tightened it up so much that it slipped right through his fingers back into legislation. Because although there are other complex regulations that banks still have to meet, our government has given private companies the authority to break the law, which in turn is bankrupting the people and the government itself. And then when our government decides to so-called fix the mess that they created, they simply make cuts to all the programs that we'd like to spend our tax dollars on, and instead direct it towards an inescapable debt. Anyway, I decided I'm going to get my five dollars, so I got to go in the bank, right? Which is it's hard because they're open for like ten seconds, they're like ah, then they close. They're never open. <laughs> but I go in. I get to a teller and I say, I want my five dollars. So she looks at me and she says, You don't have five dollars. And what happens? She says, We charge you another fifteen for only having five. So. Now, you know how much I have? I have negative 10. Negative 10. That means I don't even have no money. I, I wish I had nothing, but I don't not have any money. I don't have it. I can't afford something that doesn't cost anything. I can't afford it. If somebody goes, hey, it's free, take it. I can't afford that. That costs nothing. That's more than I need 10 bucks to be broke. So on a daily basis, how much exactly are we spending on this pointless debt? Um, I don't really know. Like, a lot. I don't even know. Like, a hundred thousand, maybe more than that. We spend a hundred and sixty million dollars every day. Are you serious? <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. That's right. According to Statistics Canada, both federal and provincial debt combined, we're paying a hundred and sixty million dollars each and every day or sixty billion dollars every year. Let's put all this into perspective. The largest counterfeiters in Canada produced three and a half million dollars and were sentenced to five years in prison. The largest bank robberies in Canada, committed by the stopwatch gang, stole about fifteen million dollars and got sixteen years in prison. As a result of borrowing from private banks, a hundred and sixty million dollars goes missing every day and no one even gets fired. So what you're saying is pretty much the banks that are in Canada that are chartered by like uh, Parliament and all that, yep. by Parliament, yep. are pretty much just robbing the Canadian government and in turn the Canadian citizens because they're causing us to have a higher tax rate than required. Yeah. Exactly you know, right. just to dig into their pockets and get themselves a little right. bit richer. Mm -hmm. So what could you do with $160 million every day? Oh my god. What I would do, I would pay off my school, I would pay off my parents' mortgage. <laughs> like, holy, I'd go on like 10 trips. <laughs> uh, let's start out with $160 million for a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind a day, buddy, because right. I'd be in a forever party. <laughs> Well, actually, I have no idea. 160 million? Like, that's so much money. I wouldn't even know what to do with that. You'd become pretty selfish, I think, right? You'd be yeah. self centered, that's for sure. Because you wouldn't have anything to care about. If you really wanted to, you could buy the Maple Leafs franchise just after a few days and still have millions left over to party with. Probably to try and forget that you bought the Leafs franchise. 
Or you could buy enough beer to keep the whole country wasted 24-7. I think we'd get a lot of votes for that. I got an idea. How about as an incentive to pay off the debt, we start stacking the payments with $100 bills and create a new national monument. Think about it. The CN Tower stands about a quarter mile high. If we stacked our debt using $100 bills, we could create the first ever money tower, totaling 540 miles high. That would dwarf the CN Tower, and it may help with our space exploration. Talk about a tourist attraction. But let's not get over our heads. First things first, we have to change this picture. Let's take a look at Canada's debt by the billions. In 1998, both federal and provincial debts combined, Canada's debt was $840 billion. Since then, the governments have used $750 billion taxpaying dollars to knock this down to... This is a direct result of what happens when you continually borrow compounding interest loans from privately run banks. In fact, this sounds a lot like the Bible when it says that the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is the slave of the lender. And as you can see, any deficits our government runs realistically turns into that number times much more. Which is also why we create such awesome things like GST and HST. I know some of you may be asking, why on earth would the government keep digging themselves a hole of debt to get out of debt? Well, obviously you don't come from Canada. You see, in Canada, when we dig ourselves into a hole, we don't use anything innovative like, let's say, a ladder to get us out. No, no. We just keep using the same shovel that got us there in the first place. I guess we figure that since the Earth is round, we should get somewhere eventually. So, we just keep digging. Keep digging until we find ourselves in a whole new world. And even if it looks scary, we're told it's the only way. Is there, would you say, a fundamental problem? Is there an underlying problem in the, in the monetary system, or is this the way it should be? No, I don't think this is an underlying problem in the monetary system. The credit is a good thing. Okay, well, how's the rest of the world doing then? What? The Earth is $52 trillion in debt? To who, Pluto? Guess again. Okay, so the money system in Canada clearly doesn't benefit the people. Why hasn't anyone told us about this? Once a nation parts with the control of its currency and credit, it matters not who makes that nation's laws. Usury once in control will wreck any nation. Until the control of the issue of currency and credit is restored to government and recognized as its most conspicuous and sacred responsibility, all talk of the sovereignty of parliament and of democracy is idle and futile. Who are you? Well, I was only the 10th Prime Minister of Canada. Whoa. Well, you definitely won't hear any of our current politicians say something nearly that profound. Yes. And now I'm ironically on the $50 bills. That sucks, man. Tell me about it. Well, that's just one Prime Minister of Canada's thoughts on money. No big deal, right? The privilege of creating and issuing money is not only the supreme prerogative of government, but it is the government's greatest creative opportunity.
The government should create, issue, and circulate all the currency and credit needed to satisfy the spending power of the government and the buying power of consumers. By the adoption of these principles, the taxpayers will be saved immense sums of interest, money will cease to be master, and become the servant of humanity. You too, Lincoln? For once, someone listened to what I said. Sorry, I just never read those statements in any school textbooks before. I made it clear that my greatest accomplishment as being president was that I killed the bank. And yet I too am ironically on the face of everything I was so passionately against. And then the private banks put your faces on their corrupt money? No offense, guys, but that's incredibly disgraceful. Especially after being assassinated. I'll say. I managed to escape. Right here, buddy. Whoever controls the volume of money in our country is absolute master of all industry and commerce. When you realize that the entire system is very easily controlled one way or another by a few powerful men at the top, you will not have to be told how periods of inflation and depression originate. Hey Garfield, weren't you president for only like four months? Well. I was killed shortly after making that comment. Oh yeah, good point. Well, anyone else? I myself prefer my New Zealand eggs for breakfast! Isn't it kind of sad that we have to dig up what our dead leaders had to say about money, instead of trusting the ones that are alive and in office today? I mean, we've seen how little they know about how the system works. So do uh, provincial governments ever borrow money from, let's say, charter banks? No. No? No. That's, that's just federal? No. As far as I know, I couldn't tell you offhand. And it's just, I, I just don't know why the government doesn't just borrow money from the Bank of Canada as it states, like in the Constitution and in the Bank of Canada Act, that it, the government has the right to do such things to prevent um, well, things like debt from happening. Mm. Well, it's, um, you may know more, more about it, obviously you've researched it a little bit more than I have. I know that they have a, a ratings um, on their uh, basis, which when they do borrow funds, um, they uh, they get uh, an interest rating. And yeah, they, yes, they will borrow money from uh, banks. Now, Canada is like the fly in the ass of an elephant in terms of the overall importance in the world. Well, the um, I'm not an economist. The prime minister is. Let's be clear about what the situation is. We have not been following the same policies as the United States. The economic and financial mess in the United States is disastrous. The policies have been irresponsible. We've made very different choices in Canada. We have a, we have a budget that's in surplus, not a budget that's in deficit. We're paying off debt in Canada, not adding to our debt. Are your policies working? Um, look, uh, I would say that overall we're being successful. We're keeping the economy on course. We're not going into a recession. We have a slowdown. But we are not in the kind of economic crisis we okay, have in the U.S. And the world is entering an economic period unlike and potentially as dangerous as anything we have faced since 1929. What happened? that me, normally a very staid banker, will lend you the money to buy a home that you don't think of. Well, 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 first of all, is, is it actually money that they're lending people? Oh yeah, they're money, they're lending money. Is it, is it actual money or is it... It's real money. It's not a receipt to present money? No, it's real money. Isn't there a difference between bank credit? Well, the, yes, there is, but, but let's go back to it. You're, you don't change the subject. I know economists will say, well, we could you know, run a small deficit, but the problem is that once you cross that line, 
uh, as we see in the United States, nothing stops deficits from getting larger and larger and spiraling out of control. Okay. Um, but no, but wait a minute. Unless you want to get, to, you're asking me what was the cause of the current crisis. Well, well, no, like, I, I just want to know where money comes from. Well, let me tell you something. Let me just take it one step further, despite the fact that's not where you want to go. I don't think we've necessarily lost control of our currency. And there are always restrictions in a global market in terms of how much control you have over your currency. But I want to go back to the, 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 the real thing, because this, yes. this is really the gen You would asked the question at the very beginning, but the financial crisis that we're in. Oh, well, it was just where does money come from? I'm, I'm not, uh, yeah, it is. No, but wait a minute, but it's really important to understand. We don't, obviously don't agree on everything, but uh, he understands that, um, I think everybody understands that Canada is a sovereign country. And whether it's dealing with the United States or dealing with China, the fact that a country is a lot bigger doesn't uh, stop us from standing up for our interests and values. Still need convincing about how ridiculous the monetary system is? It costs four cents to make one cent, which makes no sense. Or would it make sense to make no sense? Hmm. Well, this brings me to my next question. Who physically prints our government dollar bills? <laughs> the money itself is printed by the Royal Canadian Bank. The Royal Canadian Bank and the Bank of Canada? Uh, no, the Bank, is, the Bank of Canada is, the, is responsible for, for monetary policy. The actual physical production of dollar bills and five dollar bills, no, no longer dollar bills, but of bills and denominations and uh, coins by the Royal Canadian Bank. Okay. Mainly in Winnipeg. Okay, new rule. If you control the nation's money, you should probably know who prints it. I spoke to Finance Minister Jim Flaherty and I asked him where does money come from? Like who physically actually prints the dollars in Canada? And he told me it was the, the Canadian mint. Yeah, the Canadian mint. The, mint, uh, the Canadian mint prints the dollars and prints uh, and, and uh, does the coins. But do I, I thought it was the Bank of Canada that contracts the work to print? Well, the, the, well, the Bank of Canada is the central bank, mm -hmm. but the mint, the mint is responsible for providing the currency. Hmm. Then why does it say on the Bank of Canada's website that they are the country's sole banknote issuing authority? Let's try calling the mint and ask them ourselves. Do you guys have anything to do with printing the dollar bills in Canada? There is a dollar bill in Canada. But does the Canadian Mint have anything to do with printing dollar bills in Canada? No. None? No. That's the Bank of Canada, Germany, and Russia. Oh, you may want to tell that to the Finance Minister. Pardon? I said you may want to tell that to the Finance Minister. He doesn't know. Okay, so, uh, sorry, I didn't know about that. No, it's, it's okay. So just maybe make a memo for him, though. So it is the Bank of Canada who's responsible for printing our dollars, but they don't do the actual printing themselves. They contract the work to two private companies, the Canadian Banknote Company and BA International, which as of 1999 was bought by a privately owned multi-billion dollar German company called Geisek and Devriant. I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that right, which is scary considering that they're in control of printing our dollars. A few things about this German company Geisek and Devriant. They're the second largest banknote printing company in the world, and they've been involved with the printing of banknotes for two separate countries suffering from periods of hyperinflation. What is hyperinflation? Well, imagine going to the store to buy a loaf of bread on sale for $20 million. That's hyperinflation. So much money is printed that it completely devalues the dollar and prices rise dramatically because of it. That's going to be $20 million.
Okay. There's $20 million. Whoa! What are you, a bank or something? Here's a coin commemorating Germany's hyperinflationary period in the 1920s, where it's inscribed that a single glass of beer was worth $4 billion. Hyperinflation had destroyed the German dollar so much that people were actually using money as wallpaper. And who is getting paid to print all the ridiculous amounts of money this whole time? Or more recently, they were printing money for the country of Zimbabwe in their hyperinflated economy. At one point in the 1980s, the Zimbabwean dollar was actually worth more than the US dollar. But since the dictator of Zimbabwe ran his country into the ground and commanded the printing of trillions and trillions and now quadrillions of dollars backed by nothing, the conversion now is 12 billion to 1. In this photo, a few eggs are on sale for $100 billion. This guy right here is going to buy a burger and fries. So if you feel safe having millions or even billions of dollars in the bank, just remember that at a flick of a switch, the private banks can water your money down until it's worth virtually nothing. All it takes for them to do is keep printing money and everyone is poor. As for Gysek and Devrient, countries all around the world seemed outraged over the printing of all this money for Zimbabwe. In June 2008, U.S. officials announced they would not take any action against the firm that is providing key support to Zimbabwe's brutal regime and is also an important contractor to the American government. Yes, even the U.S. government is admitting how morally inappropriate it is to support Zimbabwe's brutal regime by printing these dollars. But they won't do anything to stop it that might compromise their own business with Guy Second Devriant. But hey, it's business, and in business there are no morals. You should all know that by now. But on July 1st, 2008, after only a few years since Zimbabwe's hyperinflation started to snowball, Guy Second Devriant finally decided they would no longer print banknotes for Zimbabwe, after their own government of Germany officially told them to stop. The, the reason for the sale to the, um, to the German company arose out of um, the fact that it, uh, the need, uh, counterfeiting, especially of higher notes, is a, is a problem. And it was going to be very expensive for the Canadian company to, in fact, uh, have the machinery that would produce uh, whatever the heck it is that goes into the bills that prevents counterfeiting. And that's the reason why, in fact, the company, the, the German company came in. The point is that Canada should never have let something as important as one of its banknote printing companies to have been bought by foreign companies who support racist dictators. And the excuse to save money is ridiculous when you recall the $160 million every day the government allows to go down the drain. I'm just wondering if there should be like an institution that the Bank of Canada owns that's job is to print money. And well, that, that would be, uh, that would make more sense, yeah. Let's try to recap everything we've learned so far. The Canadian government creates the phony laws necessary to give banks the power to create and manage money for the hard-working people of Canada, apparently for our benefit. However, the money that's created by these private banks is made and backed by nothing and attached with compounded interest. It's then lent to teachers, students, workers and families who now have to pay back the banks what was made from nothing many times over with hard work. This creates a debt-based economy since the majority of money that now circulates was created from a mortgage or some other kind of expensive loan. When an employer pays an employee, it's not actually money, but someone else's debt. In other words, we're trading debt, not money. Okay, so, so you wouldn't be for creating debt-free money system? No. 
would would uh, a debt free money system be good for the country or not? No, no, it would. It, it it's it would. I think we'd be better off without a public debt. What's wrong with everyone? Have they all lost their minds? In that sense, is is a debt free or debt based money system? Is that healthy for Canada? Do you think? Healthy in the short term, because the alternative is that if you try to balance the books today, uh, you will in fact tip the scales very much in favor of a depression and deflation. Thank you. Well, luckily for Canadians, we have a way to fix these problems very easily. The reality is the Bank of Canada has, by legislation, the ability to make whatever money is needed to loan money to the Government of Canada without interest. The Bank of Canada, as it's stated on its official website, is ultimately owned by the people of Canada and has the power under the Canadian Constitution and the Bank of Canada Act to lend money to the government at no interest. And if there is interest to be charged, it would just come back to the people anyway, since we own the bank. I must admit, I'd rather pay interest to myself than, you know, in exactly. which case I'd probably give, cut myself a good deal, you know. <laughs> Yeah, we never should have privatized our debt and turned it over to the private banks. We should have kept it in the hands of Bank of Canada, at least a major part of it, uh, because then we would have been paying interest back to ourselves. If that on, you can borrow from your savings account and I won't charge you any interest. Good. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, the Liberal government and the Conservative governments both uh, are too close to the banks. The banks wanted the business and uh, they managed to convince the government to privatize that uh, debt and of course now they uh, they're the ones getting the uh, the benefits that's why you notice that they're still very profitable even though everyone else is suffering Here's a rough example about how money in Canada should work. The Canadian government realizes it needs money to help make the country work. So it creates the Bank of Canada, whose sole task is to create and manage money for the people. The government then creates what's called a treasury bond, which is simply an IOU, a piece of paper promising to repay the amount of money that it borrows. This IOU is then given to the Bank of Canada, who then creates the money, the same way private banks do, out of nothing. But since it's owned and operated by the people of the country, there's no reason to charge any interest. The government can now distribute the money which creates jobs. The people can now pull some of their money together and pay off the debt owed to the Bank of Canada, the People's Bank. After the first payment or so, since the Bank of Canada will have to pay its workers and fulfill its job to regulate money, our tax dollars will inevitably circle back into the country, so no new money is required to pay off the debt. And since there is no compounding interest, the debt will never grow, and we'll be able to pay it off very quickly. And once it's paid off, we'll be able to spend our extra hard work time and money on other things to help better the country. Oh, I, I don't need it. to hear the lecture. I know all of this stuff. Okay, well, <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but I, I don't, just ask me your question. Okay, okay, well, <laughs> and I'm not that knowledgeable about monetary policy, and the Green Party policies have not moved into the, have not yet adopted mm -hmm. the monetary policy that some of our members would like, which is one which would say we should get rid of the loans that we owe commercial banks and transfer that to the Bank of Canada and pay it off with a Bank of Canada loan and then cancel the debt. Hmm. Well, they both seem to know a lot about the monetary system to me. And yet last October in 2008, when the central topic in the federal election was about the economy, we made a decision to give priority to an issue dominating the news and people's concerns these days, the economy. So there will be an expanded debate on that. Not one single mention was made from any one of the parties about the monetary system, even from the ones who clearly knew about it. But if we go back to the 2006 federal debate, 
No one would shut up about the $100 million missing from the sponsorship scandal Paul Martin was involved with. But when $160 million goes missing every day, it's no big deal. Look, this is a mutual problem that every party should agree on fixing. And yet in the most important broadcasted debates prior to our elections, it's not even mentioned once. So coming back to the Bank of Canada, is there really any logical reason why we don't use it? What would make the government want to borrow money from uh, private banks instead of the Bank of Canada? It should deal with the Bank of Canada, period. Hmm. That's coming from a former finance minister and later prime minister. Let's compare that to Paul Martin, who shares the exact same titles. Does the, does the prime minister or president of either Canada or America have the ability to create debt free money? Absolutely. Absolutely, okay. Because um, I, I, I was reading a quote but by. You've got to ask the question why, can't, why don't they? Why don't they? Right. Why don't they? Because it's inflationary. Because well, it drives it, it drive inflation through the roof. How, how's that? Well, <laughs> here, the gla here are my glasses. It's the only pair of glasses in the world. Okay? And um, I, uh, I'm going to sell them for a dollar, right? And you have a dollar. And you don't have any money at all, or no, you have ten dollars, and you don't have any money at all. These glasses are on sale for a dollar. Okay, so you come to both come to see me, and you want to buy the glasses. I say, okay, fine. How, how much will you pay me? And you say, I can't pay any. I'm getting money. So I turn to you, and you say, well, fine. I'm the only buyer. I'll pay you a dollar, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's say the glasses are on sale for a dollar today, and you both have ten dollars, right? So you come to me and you say, and you both desperately want my glasses. So you say to me, uh, I'll give you a dollar. And I say, well, okay, they're worth for sale for a dollar, but what will you give me? What are you going to say to me? Two. You're going to say two dollars. Two dollars. Sure. Okay. All of a sudden, these glasses, which were worth one dollar, are now worth two dollars. That's inflation. Mm -hmm. And that's inflation. The more money there is in supply, the danger there is there's going to be inflation. That's why everybody says what's happening now as a result of what's going on in the United States is that five years from now we're going to have massive inflation. So, so it, is, it is the amount of money in circulation that causes inflation, not who distributes the money, right? It's largely the amount of money in circulation. It, it, well, it, yeah, there are a lot of reasons, but it's, yes, that drives up the price. That drives up prices because more people can afford to buy something. Okay, I'm going to replay the last few seconds of that. Remember, he began saying that it was borrowing money from the Bank of Canada that would cause inflation. The more money there is in supply, the danger there is there's going to be inflation. That's why everybody says what's happening now as a result of what's going on in the United States is that five years from now we're going to have massive inflation. So, so it, is, it is the amount of money in circulation that causes inflation, not who distributes the money, right? It's largely the amount of money in circulation. Well, it, yeah, there are a lot of reasons, but it's yes, that drives up the price. That drives up prices because more people can afford to buy something. I think what he's trying to say is now that he's allowed the private banks to make up this magical money that keeps growing in their favor, the government shouldn't borrow money from the Bank of Canada since they would have to create new numbers that don't already exist. But if the Bank of Canada had just been doing its job from the start, it wouldn't make a difference anyway. Do you see how absurd it is to say that the Bank of Canada causes inflation? Besides, since 95% of money is created by private banks, they're the cause of 95% of inflation. Because of the decisions made by Prime Ministers like Paul Martin, this is how money in Canada sadly works. When the Bank of Canada receives the Treasury Bond, or IOU, from the government, they forfeit their duties to create and manage money themselves and instead hand it over to the private banks. The private banks can now lend their debt-based checkbook money to the government. Compounded interest inevitably takes its toll. And this leads to unfair taxes on the people of the country who have done nothing wrong. And when we need real physical cash to trade smaller amounts of money, the Bank of Canada contracts the work to foreign companies who also print money for dictators. 
and Canadian Tire. And people wonder why we're in a major economic crisis. Look at the system. good news for Canadians is we're slow to get into the slowdown and mm -hmm. we will likely be quick to get out of it mm -hmm. because our country basically um, is solid. I mean, we have a highly regulated industry uh, that has been uh, remarkably successful and uh, has an enormous amount of stability and has a lot of federal controls in. We met with the uh, chief economist from the Royal Bank who said that uh, the States is, is trying to move towards a Canadian banking system to give it more stability. Is the whole world on stupid pills? This much debt is nothing to be proud of. And now countries around the world, including the United States, want to emulate the Canadian banking system? They're in for a shock. Because the government's in debt, students are in debt, farmers, teachers, parents, artists, everyone. And a wise man once said, poverty is the mother of crime. Well, I guess um, I would look at it a little bit differently because mm -hmm. the banks are publicly traded companies and many of these banks, when you look at uh, pension funds, uh, RSPs, RESPs, things along those lines, um, the banks make money and then they pay it out to shareholders. Um, it doesn't just, you know, disappear. Well, $24 billion just disappeared from the Canadian pension plan. But that didn't stop David Dennison, president and CEO of CPP, and his executives from pocketing millions of dollars in bonuses. Or how about the $40 billion that just disappeared from the Quebec pension company? People like to say, oh, the bad banks, they're making too much money. Uh, but it actually, in the big scheme of things, it's, it's a good thing that companies make money. That's how the whole system is based. That's how... Uh, people's retirements, mm -hmm. their investments, it all, that's how it works. So when our banks are doing bad, our pensions are at risk. And when our banks are doing good, our pensions are still at risk. Gotcha. Why don't we just fix the monetary system? I'm sure all the time, work, and trillions of dollars Canadians would save would more than compensate for the banks not screwing everyone over just to maybe get a pension and in return the quality of life for Canadians would improve tremendously we would have more time to spend with our families more time for our hobbies and all the other things we love in life and if you're a workaholic you'll be glad to know that you'd be receiving more rewards for your labor since we won't be slaving over user debts anymore from what you're saying is that we could have a country that is the most highly advanced country in the world because we wouldn't have it then if we took these issues into consideration and tried to make some changes. That's right. And if your concerns are for the environment or underprivileged countries, imagine the differences you'd be able to make with billions of more tax dollars a year going to that cause. But the reality is we're a sinking ship. So how on earth can we save others if we can't save ourselves? You know, like if I like if I were running this country, I think you could pretty much say to the banks, "Well, we're not paying you back. Like if you don't like it, you get the out of the country." Yeah. You know? So where am I going with all of this? Well, if we take a look at the preamble from the Bank of Canada Act, it states that the bank exists to regulate credit and currency in the best interests of the economic life of the nation. But since we own the bank, and it obviously isn't operating in the best interests of the nation or its owners there's clearly a conflict of interest and this needs to be looked at very seriously because every country uses the same sort of banking system and this system is bankrupting all the countries that use it the governments of the world are surrendering themselves to the international banking institutions the world bank IMF and BIS these institutions have a history for supporting dozens of military dictatorships with billions of dollars in loans and also wreak havoc on developed and underdeveloped countries including our own. So for instance, why do we have a health care crisis now? We have a health care crisis in 2009 
because in 1994, the International Monetary Fund wrote a report to the government of Canada that said, and at that point we were we were in debt. Remember, this was right before Paul Martin's slaying of the deficit. So yeah, it would have been like 600, 500 billion. Days. It was, a, and, and the IMS report was okay. Canada's not, you know, we're not we're not saying you're a basket case, but our view of your financial viability, and that of course translates into how the bond raters in New York take our financial viability. We would think, you know, we think you'd do better if you did the following things. Uh, stop student bursaries and convert them to interest-bearing student loans. Cut the CBC, cut the NFB, cut via rail, reduce the number of hospital beds you've got. Now all of those things happened. There was never any democratic debate about it. We lost 20 percent of our hospital beds in Canada in the year and a half after the IMF report to the government of Canada. But nobody even really knows it happened. The World Health Organization knows it happened because they've actually done reports on Canada as one of the only modern democracies to have deliberately slashed its health care provision in order to slay a deficit. And it's proven, the World Health Organization studies prove that in doing that, we actually made our health care situation not only is the health care worse, but the costs of health care went up because people couldn't access timely health care when they needed it before it became a disaster. So, but who, 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 was in who, who actually made those cuts? Paul Martin. We were told by the IMF that certain things should be slashed. Now, why couldn't a government say to the IMF, go fly a kite? Well, simple reason. Once you have indebtedness to a foreign country or foreign banks, and your credit rating really matters. If you drop from a triple A credit rating to a double A credit rating, as you guys know, your interest rates are going to go up on the debt you have. So you'll be spending more and more and more out of the federal treasury or in the provincial treasury. Uh, and that's why Bob Ray, by the way, as Premier of Ontario, didn't keep his campaign promises. Didn't keep them because he got to Ontario and discovered that if he did the things he promised, bond raiders in New York, anonymous people, nothing to do with Canadian democracy, would make a decision to, to, to drop Ontario's credit rating such that any promises Ray was trying to keep would come from a smaller and smaller and smaller amount of an available budget because more of his budget would have to go to paying interest on the debt. So they have you over a barrel. So once you have uh, a debt, particularly to external sources, now why, you know, if you have a debt to the Bank of Canada, it doesn't matter. If you have a debt that is external, that the rest of the world is looking at how large is your deficit, how large is your debt, how much trouble are you in? I mean, look at the United States right now. It's the biggest debt or country in the world. China holds most of the paper. Despite of all of this, Jim Flaherty, like his predecessors, is bowing down to the World Bank institutions, which will continue to surrender our currency to international bankers, people who none of us have ever voted for. And as we've learned from our own Prime Minister, Mackenzie King, once a nation parts with the control of its currency and credit, it matters not who makes that nation's laws. Pope Benedict XVI is calling for a new world financial order. In the third encyclical of his pontificate, Benedict denounced the profit-at-all-cost mentality of the globalized economy, and he lamented that greed brought about the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. The document, entitled Charity and Truth, was released just hours before the G8 summit gets underway in Italy. And at the G8 summit, the president of Russia presented what he called a united future world currency. He told reporters, here it is, you can see it, you can touch it. The pontiff stressed that he is not opposed to a globalized economy, saying that if done correctly, it has unprecedented potential to redistribute wealth around the world. I don't know how many economics classes the Pope has attended, but I can assure you, these are the kinds of crucial steps necessary to establish a one-world government, which last time I checked conflicts with Canada being an independent sovereign country. In closing, we must regain control of our country's currency from the private banks, both domestic and international. If our governments can make the laws that give away our currency, then they can make the laws that take it back. And while we're at it, maybe the Bank of Canada's logo should finally be changed to a Canadian maple leaf. After all, a good mother knows when to let her child leave the nest. Sorry, Britain. And if we truly love our country and our children, 
We'll do something now to save them from a life of debt slavery. I mean, you wouldn't want to borrow money from the Mafia and leave the debt to your kids to deal with. We always hear about transparency in government, but we never really see it. And if we did, it would probably scare the living hell out of us. How many of you can identify this man? His name is Paul Demeray, but you can call him the Canadian Monopoly guy. His family owns and operates Power Corp, one of the largest corporations in Canada. Power Corp owns a dozen companies ranging from financial institutions to newspapers and media, oil and energies, and more, that produce revenues of $24 billion a year and several hundred billion dollars in assets. But his most powerful investments by far are not in world resources, but politicians. Well, what do you think a man's intentions are when he owns a monopolizing corporation called Power Corp? Just some of his employees consisted of three of Canada's longest running prime ministers in recent years, Pierre Trudeau, Brian Mulroney, and Jean Chrétien. As a matter of fact, Paul Demeray's son, André Demeray, now co-owner of Power Corp along with his brother, is actually married to Jean Chrétien's daughter, France. So you can only imagine how close these two powerful families are with many years of history. Other employees for Paul Demeray are former premiers of Ontario and Quebec, William Davis, John Roberts, and Daniel Johnson. Or how about John Ray, brother of Liberal NDP Bob Ray? John is currently Executive Vice President for Power Corp and was longtime advisor to Jean Chrétien, as well as his campaign chairman. There's also former President of Power Corp, Maurice Strong. After becoming a successful businessman with Power Corp and Paul Demeray, he was able to bridge himself from business to politics with his new circle of friends. He became first Executive Director of the UN Environment Program and President of the World Federation of UN Associations. Remember, this is a businessman. Some of Maurice's friends include the likes of the World Bank President, James Wolfenson, former Vice President of the U.S., Al Gore, and former Swedish Prime Minister and member of the Global Governance Institution, Ingvar Carlsson. And last, but certainly not least, Paul Martin. Paul became president and CEO of one of Power Corp's subsidiary companies, the Canadian Steamship Line, which was eventually sold to him in the 1980s. During his ownership of the Canadian Steamship Line, Martin changed the flags on the ships in order to operate shell companies in overseas countries like Singapore and the Bahamas, where he could exploit the laws to profit from cheap labor, lower environmental standards, and paying virtually no income tax on revenues of several hundred millions of dollars. After giving his steamship company to his kids, in 2003 he was fit to become Prime Minister of Canada and tell everyone else to pay income tax. And in January 2004, the Canadian federal government revealed that Martin's steamship line company had received over $100 million in federal government contracts, grants, and loans since Martin became finance minister in 1993. This was the same time he was cutting taxpayers' dollars to our schools and hospitals in order to slave the inescapable debt. You can bet with gifts like these, Martin would have to remain pretty loyal to the man who established his family fortune and political success, Mr. Monopoly Man. I mean, Paul Demery. And how many of you even knew his name? Some of Paul Demeray's other friends include the Bush family, the Clinton family, and the President of France, Nicolas Sarkozy. When you consider the circle of friends surrounding Paul Demeray, it's not hard to imagine how government corruption can set in. But it's our government officials who should never be this infatuated with making money and powerful corporate allies. And yet, sadly, we see exactly that. 
And this is just the tip of the iceberg when you consider these next things. Bilderbergers. Not Bilderberger, but members of the Bilderberg Group. The Bilderberg Groups consist of some of the largest visible corporate, political, and royalty members of the world. They hold their meetings annually, usually in remote places where there's no media allowed, at least to broadcast what goes on, because there's plenty of members of the media attending the meetings, such as Chairman of the Board of the Washington Post, Major Media Outlet Owner Rupert Murdoch, and News Anchor Peter Jennings. Some of the other members include Presidents of the United States, such as Bill Clinton and Gerald Ford. Bankers attend, of course. World Bank President Wolfenson, Alan Greenspan, Chairman of the Federal Reserve, and Timothy Geithner, President of the Federal Reserve, and somehow became U.S. Secretary of Treasury. He looks confused about it, too. That would be like the President of RBC becoming our Finance Minister. It just reeks of corruption. Dozens of corporate giants sit in as well, such as the CEO and Chairman of Google, the CEO of IBM, and the chairman of Nokia and Shell. And who could forget the hard-working royal families? Prince Charles of England and Queen Sophia of Spain. Both go to Bilderberg. And wouldn't you know it, Pierre Trudeau, Jean Chrétien, Paul Martin, and Stephen Harper have also all attended. What, what is your opinion on these secretive meetings that I hear about of uh, the Bilderberg group that comes time to time in Canada and they get together I think once a year random places kind of uh, in the in the world. Well, I don't I don't, I, don't, I don't like that and I don't like the Canadian conference of uh, Canadian executives, Tom DeQuino being part of it. I mean they, they meet in Banff and behind closed doors to sell out Canadian sovereignty by, by, by saying you know Canadian business is for sale. I don't know why these people, why they're meeting in the first place. You can't tell me, they can't. Nobody can tell us why. Maybe they're talking about uh, wallpapering the walls, who knows, right? Well, they're so secret that they, you know, I don't like to say in general, I don't think any good comes of meetings that are secret. Uh, there's Democracy really thrives in sunshine and things that are anti-democratic do best under rocks, right? So if you keep things out of the public eye and they're not accountable, uh, that's, that's concerning. Obviously, if you're negotiating um, a peace agreement, uh, the doors are shut till you come out, I mean, that's a good thing. But generally, people know what's going on. These meetings are so secretive that nobody knows what's going on. Uh, and similarly, the Security and Prosperity Partnership meetings, where the only people allowed in the room are governments and business leaders. Uh, that that's anti-democratic. I don't like things that are anti-democratic. Bilderberg meetings, have you heard of this? I've heard about them. I don't know what that is. I mean, I've uh, secret society type meetings and they well, discuss. Uh, I recall one being at a place where I went with a friend uh, in uh, in Ottawa. Um, I'm trying to think of the place, and it was a hotel outside of Ottawa. Right. In Canada. It was, was that just two years ago? Yeah, yeah, it was actually, I was up there because my one of my good friends was getting married. We went to a Neil Young concert uh, oh, that cool. night, and uh, and uh, the next day it was uh, all these people were moving in, security and everything. It's, yeah. a, so it's the Bilderberg Conference. So Again, like our, if our previous prime minister, or current, current prime ministers have attended these meetings and don't really talk about it, is there, do you think there would be something to be worried about, though? No, not necessarily. I mean, if uh, to, to put the, the scenario forward that you're talking about, if the, the hundred top people in the world invited me to a meeting, do you think I'd turn it down? Probably not. I've never been invited, so naturally I'm suspicious. It's an interesting group, I, but I, I can't firmly say that I don't know that I know nothing about it. I mean, I've uh, I've heard what it could mean. Um, uh, I listen to Richard Serrett from time to time on CFRB at uh, give me a time ten o'clock at night. Um, I don't know, and I but I'd certainly like to learn more about it. But it is apparently behind closed doors. Um, I'm. I'm suspicious of those 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 those, uh, those meetings. Were, were you ever invited or? Were no, they know my views about it. In 1996, Paul Martin and Jean Chrétien, among other Canadians, attended the Bilderberg meeting held in Toronto, King City. The building picked was naturally a 66 million dollar resort, which was then owned by CIBC Bank. 
Some of the other members that attended that year were Ted Rogers, Chairman, President, and CEO of Bell Canada, Chairman of Ford Motor Company, everyone's favorite Conservative Premier of Ontario, Mike Harris, Conrad Black, owner of many newspapers, and just recently sentenced to 78 months in a U.S. federal prison for wire fraud and obstruction of justice. Chairman of CIBC Bank, President of the National Bank of Hungary, David Rockefeller, Chairman of the Chase Manhattan Bank, and many, many more. But for those of you who don't know the Rockefeller family, they have a bit of a nasty history of playing Monopoly in America, as well as being a major supporter in the creation of a one-world government. But don't take my word for it. Listen to David Rockefeller himself. We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subject to the bright lights of publicity during those years. But the world is now much more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto-determination practiced in past centuries. I wish I was making this stuff up, but if you open up page 405 in Rockefeller's own autobiography, he states that, For more than a century, ideological extremists at either end of the political spectrum has seized upon well-publicized incidents such as my encounter with Castro to attack the Rockefeller family for the inordinate influence they claim we wield over American political and economic institutions. Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure one world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty, and I am proud of it. I bring this up because this man attends the same secret meetings all of our leading government officials do. Now, those are the three issues that I'm working on. You may have others. Let's hear from them. You may not agree with me. Let's hear that. That's a lot more fun. And let's just talk about where we're going. Thank you very, very much. I was able to catch up with Paul Martin on this topic at the University of Waterloo with a youth group I was a member of called Future Canada. Uh, this was about, um, I believe in 1996, you attended a meeting called the Bilderberg Meeting, and as I think you were Minister of Finance at the time. Um, not many people know about the Bilderberg Meeting. I try to speak to people about it and they think I'm crazy or that it doesn't exist or anything like that. Namely because it's not really widespread in media, and in fact a lot of media representatives actually attend the meetings themselves, and they just choose not to disclose the information, the context of it. I'm just wondering, uh, in 1996 when you attended, like just details, like I mean if, if you could explain like who invited you, why did you go, what, what were your thoughts on it? Well I can't remember who invited me, but I, I remember why once. Bilderberg meeting is a meeting of very influential people around the world. Canada at that at that point was considered a, a third world basket case. We were in trouble up for eyeball. And I had to go, I, I essentially went to Thomas Market, went to them and say, look, we're getting our act together. And it worked. Uh, okay, well one of the members of the Bilderberg meeting actually sorry. Are you not going to take questions from the floor? Okay, check that question. Um, but just one thing about that Bilderberg meeting is that one of the attendees uh, named Dave Rockefeller, and when I heard you talking earlier about this global financial crisis that everyone's involved in, and, it's, and just like Stephen Harper said, that possibly this is going to be as bad or worse than the Great Depression in 1929, and not many of us have actually lived in those times, so we don't know what we're actually facing, but it could be pretty bad. And one of the members of the Bilderberg meeting stated in the Bilderberg meeting that uh, we are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis, and the nations will accept the new world order. 
And this, this is someone who attended the same meetings as you and no one really knows about it. In fact, actually, most of the last four uh, five prime ministers we've had have attended these meetings too, Stephen Harper, John Cushing, and so on and so on. And I spoke to John Turner, a former prime minister as well, who didn't attend, and I asked him what he thought of it. And he said very specifically that it's basically a group of businessmen who get together behind closed doors and sell out Canadian sovereignty. He said he didn't like them at all and he was very skeptic. Well, I don't, I, 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 it may well be at the meeting that I went to. Um, I can't remember if David Rockefeller was there. There was no question of Canadian sovereignty. But what there was was a, a group of people. This was the year that the Wall Street Journal called Canada uh, essentially a banana republic. It said that we were a third world country and we were going down. And I've got to tell you that my first couple of years as finance minister, I did nothing but go around the world basically saying that Canada was going to turn it around. We did. We did it. Within four years, we had the best balance sheet of any country in the world. So, so what, is your, what is your opinion about it? Okay. It's really good. It was really, really good stuff. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I don't know if the system did, did he come over and Yeah. Uh, he just, he told me to like because I don't know what it was. He he, he just said that I could ask no more questions. Yeah. I, again, that's what his chief of staff. Uh, yeah, that's that's yeah. that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah I think it was felt a little bit of an attack on him, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, and so he said like if he's gonna ask any more questions that he would just have a smart leave. Okay, if you're an RCMP officer, could you care to explain why Canadian tax dollars are going to protect this guy instead of putting him behind bars? He's conspiring with international bankers in secret who openly talk about world domination via major world crises, on top of participating in the largest theft ever committed in our country's history. And when confronted about all of this, he acts like a child and has his chief of staff remove my microphone. Is this any way for a Prime Minister of Canada to act? Surely this is newsworthy. Good thing CTV was there to catch the footage. University of Waterloo, an unusual send-off. While most students kick off reading week with a party, a large crowd gathered to get a chance to talk with former Prime Minister Paul Martin. CTV's Nicole Lampa is here with this story. Nicole, what did they discuss? Kyle, given that Martin was a former finance minister, the economy was the key discussion. Every country is focusing on what can they do in order to stimulate their, their national economies. A worldwide problem is being felt by these students. What can we as the West? Matthew Castle asks a former Prime Minister and Finance Minister how to survive the economic downturn, not just as a student, but also as a future leader. As a young person, I'm going to be inheriting this economy. I'm going to be inheriting the budget deficit that Stephen Harper is now racking up. Um, and I think it's important for me to be informed so that I can make good choices and make good decisions. When you have someone that has done it in the past and effected change, you know, be it whether you agreed with the way he did it or not, uh, it really inspires you to do something. Others feel the same way. It's just interesting to hear um, someone of this caliber speak on these kinds of issues. He can tell us a lot about uh, about what's going on. He has a ton of pers perspective. He was a fantastic politician. In my experience, is that you can't judge these crises, uh, and they are normally worse. Which is why you've got to keep your, as a country, keep your balance sheet in surplus, and you got to make sure you have the room to maneuver. The economy wasn't the only topic. Martin also talked about Canada's treatment of Aboriginals, a role in Africa and Afghanistan. For Matthew, these are issues he doesn't mind tackling. I think when times are tough, that's when you're most needed. And if I would have something to contribute, I'd be more than happy to do it. Now the talk was put on by UW's Federation of Students and a Canadian youth group. This is one of the most disgraceful pieces of journalism I've probably ever seen. Nicole Lampa refused to talk to me on camera, and later after watching the program she put together, I asked her why she didn't at least give the name of my youth group who arranged the whole event in the first place. She told me she was under the impression that my youth group's name was A Canadian Youth Group, and then quickly hung up the phone. In fact, the most coverage that my cause had received from the whole event was published in the local Waterloo paper called The Record where it was written that 
And of course there was that one passionately idealistic student who grilled Martin relentlessly until the microphone practically had to be wrestled from his hands. By the way, I'm not a student at the University of Waterloo. I can't afford it. But again, poor journalism. So here we have the guy who writes the laws, and one of the guys who abuses the laws, which is bankrupting the entire country. Getting together in his $66 million private resort, in secret, along with other bankers who admit major crises are used to form a one-world government, ruled by bankers and elitists. You see, Paul Martin doesn't care if he helps bankrupt the people of Canada, because he's already made his millions from the guy who practically made him Prime Minister. But instead of exposing this, these two news agencies did the opposite and made Paul Martin look more like a saint. This is the opposite of information. Misinformation. So now do you see why the owners of the media attend these secret meetings as well? They don't want to expose the truth, because if they did, they would expose themselves. Take this copy of Reader's Digest. The Canadians You Trust. Let's check out who made the list. Stephen Harper, number 8. Michael J. Fox is number 5. Wayne Gretzky, number 12. Queen of England is number 2. She's not even Canadian. But I guess simple facts don't matter when you're a major publishing company. Number 1 was David Suzuki, Mr. If You Can't Beat Walmart, Join Them. Bob Ray is number 29. Shania Twain, 30. Don Cherry is number 14. What's going on here? How was this list even put together? If you read the fine print, it states, To conduct our trust poll, we commissioned an independent research firm, Harris DeSima, to survey a representative sample of nearly 1,200 English-speaking Canadian adults. Respondents were presented with a list containing the names and photographs of a hundred prominent Canadians and asked to rate each according to trustworthiness. They were then asked to select which personality they trusted the most, giving us our list of the 50 most trusted Canadians. Wow! What an informative study! That's just a loophole to get away with publishing a magazine titled The Canadians You Trust and then putting Stephen Harper and other corrupt politicians on the list. Because what they should have called the magazine was Canadians Nearly 1200 People Trust from a pre-selected media biased list of figures used only to spread propaganda. I mean, who has the power to tell you who to trust, other than yourself? Well, apparently Reader's Digest. But wait a minute, I thought CNN was most trusted. Hmm, maybe that was based on another elaborate trust poll, where CNN wasn't on the list. Here's a quick word fact. The literal translation for the word entertainment is... Diversion! Ah, it all makes perfect sense now. Because people are more worried about how Jen still can't get it together, Inch by inch, these global elitists are getting closer to their goal of world domination. Thanks, Rick. You know, I always had a feeling you would be involved in the destruction of the world. The media is doing such a great job at convincing everyone that politics in Canada is as simple as red versus blue. When in reality, as we've seen behind closed doors, they all belong to the same clubs, all serving the same corporate masters. Consider politicians like a box of Smarties. All different colors on the outside, but on the inside, they're all full of the same crap. When people get sick of red, blue steps in to give the illusion of democracy. This game goes back and forth for years and years and years. Sometimes we get a little bit of hope from orange or green. But because they don't have the powerful corporate backing behind them like blue and red, they'll never get into power unless they sell their souls as well.
Hmm. It's not so bad. It's a little bit sour, but... But democracy isn't only a joke in Canada. Let's hear a good knee slapper from Al Gore, former vice president of the superpower of the world, the United States. I am Al Gore. I used to be the next president of the United States of America. I don't find that particularly funny. Pretty good material, eh? He just cracked a joke about the widely known fact that George Bush Jr. had rigged the 2000 U.S. election. That's a former vice president of the United States joking about democracy not working. And one has to seriously wonder, why didn't Al Gore make a movie about the U.S. election being rigged by the biggest laughingstock president the world has ever seen? I mean, to me, democracy being a joke is much scarier than climate change, especially since that he would have had much more power to fix things as president than just some guy with a slideshow. But it didn't really bother Al Gore since he's in the club as well. So it isn't his position to actually do what's right, but rather to do what he's told. Which is why the joke is funny. The real sad thing, though, is the audience thinks they're laughing with him. This is the reason why pro-voting ads are sponsored by the government and are practically shoved down our throats. They want us to play into the game that gives them the power to control us. Look, if voting really made a difference, our monetary system would have been fixed by now. So without further ado, let us introduce the new Smarty of Canada, Count Ignatiev. But he's kind of he's kind of quirky. Like as a human rights expert, there's a lot of his writing that suggests that some people are entitled to human rights and others aren't. Mm. But the essence of human rights is everybody's entitled yeah. to human rights. So it comes from his experience of being um, Russian royalty. His grandfather was an aide to, to Tsar Nicholas. And one of the only families that escaped from Russia from the Bolsheviks was the Ignatievs. And he's got good, like he's got this kind of aristocratic, almost uh. royalty attitude. Michael's grandfather, Count Paul Ignatiev, was senior advisor to Emperor Nicholas II of Russia. He also served as his last Minister of Education. Why the last? Because as a result of the Russian Revolution in 1918, the whole royal family was arrested and executed. Except for Michael Ignatiev's grandfather, who was apparently released by a sympathetic guard and fled to Canada. Count Ignatiev's son, George, grew up to become a Rhodes Scholar, worked in the Department of External Affairs, became a permanent representative to NATO, also became Canadian Ambassador and President of the UN Security Council. Finally, when Michael was born, opportunities were paved in front of him by his family, and he was able to attend and later teach in universities across the world, such as Oxford, Harvard, Cambridge, University of London, and a lot more. As a matter of fact, Michael Ignatiev has spent half of his life outside of Canada becoming educated and prepared for bigger things. In 2004, Ian Davey, son of the Canadian Senator Keith Davey and a lawyer Daniel Brock, both liberal organizers, went to the United States where Ignatiev was teaching at Harvard still and told him that it was time for him to establish himself in Canadian politics in order to become Prime Minister. And in an ultra-rare occasion, Ignatiev was crowned Liberal leader half a year before the Liberal Convention was held.
But again, this shouldn't be a surprise to any of you by now, since we know they're all buddies behind the scenes. Ignatieff released a book this year in April called True Patriot Love, in a sad attempt to look like a Canadian patriot. But just writing a book and declaring something doesn't make it true. You can't judge a book by its cover. But it does conveniently add to the deception. Let me close just one, one, one more thing on this question of sovereignty. It's very difficult for a large country to accept that somebody is going to come in, like the United States or like the Europeans, and is basically going to come in and say, you're not doing your regulation in a proper way. Fair game. But what's going to happen when China and India are economies as powerful as the United States or Europe? And what's going to happen when there's a mortgage meltdown in India? What's going to happen when a Chinese hedge fund goes under and that the results of that tsunami don't stop at the Chinese or the Indian border, but that in fact you find them in Idaho and Iowa and California? Who's going to deal with that unless we're prepared to understand that in fact we're all going to have to give up a little bit of our sovereignty in order to make the world work? I hope that that also is something that the G20 comes to deal with. So those are the issues that I've got to deal with. I think that we are really at the beginning of a very different era. 1944, the great minds of the world, Dexter White, John Maynard Keynes and a bunch, essentially laid the foundations for the Bretton Woods institutions in the United Nations. And they built a system which functioned for over 50 to 60 years. I think that it's time to renew that vision. A very different world than one that they did, an independent nation states who simply came together but could ignore essentially what was going on inside those countries. That day is over, thanks to Alan Law. I think we've got to take it one step further. And we've got to say that, in fact, countries have responsibilities to their neighbors. And their neighbors are in every nook and cranny of the world. And I believe that that is going to become the debate of our generation. And it's one that I'm very happy to share with you. Thank you very much. If you're watching this movie thinking to yourself, What the fuck? Just remember that the government works for the people, not the other way around. These issues should be a concern to all political parties, and really anyone that can count to two. Therefore, we shouldn't have to depend on any conventional election to resolve these problems. Besides, as we've seen, every political party is guilty. So in hopes to create a freer and more prosperous Canada, we will be supplying information on our website on how to contact your government officials with facts about these underlying problems. Share it with other people as well, because we need to at least establish a dialogue before moving on to any sort of remedy. Never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So please, get up and do something, because the future of our country depends on it. From true morality. From far and wide, oh Canada, we've lost our sovereignty. We can do this thing, baby. God keep our land. 
hopefully debt free. Oh, Canada, we have no dignity. Oh, Canada, what's left to stand? Like it a town.